from Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Issue one, dream on. Fifty years ago this month, a Baptist minister named Martin Luther King delivered what many believe to be the most inspirational speech in American oratory. Dr. King's 1963 address came against the backdrop of the Birmingham, Alabama march against anti-black racism. That toxic combination of legal segregation and second-class status for African-American citizens. The brilliance of King's nonviolent protest movement was its combination of lofty, almost utopian ideals matched to concrete political goals. King supporters marched for the right to sit at a lunch counter, to swim in a desegregated municipal pool, to pick any seat on a bus, or to attend an integrated school. That was then. This is now. Reverend King would be amazed by the transformation over the past 50 years. Today, America has its first black president. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. And African Americans routinely hold top cabinet posts like Secretary of State, Attorney General, National Security Advisor. Top corporations like Merck, American Express, McDonald's, and Xerox have had or have now black CEOs. Oprah Winfrey is America's second black billionaire, following in the footsteps of publishing mogul Robert L. Johnson. African Americans are among the country's top sports stars and entertainment celebrities in fields once restricted by race, swelling the ranks of black millionaires. Yet in other ways, America is far from King's dream. Racial divides persist in income, educational achievement, and poverty. Question, are we less conscious of race today than in 1963, more conscious of race today, or are things about the same, Pat Buchanan? I think we're probably more conscious right now, John, but I was at the March on Washington. I was up there in the Lincoln Memorial when Dr. King gave that address. And that was a moment really when the, of the cresting of the civil rights movement, it was right within the same year after Oxford, Mississippi, they had the violence down there to keep black students out. George Wallace had stood in the schoolhouse door in June. And King, it was a march for jobs and freedom, but that didn't produce the Civil Rights Act. What produced it, John, was the death of John F. Kennedy a couple of months later when he was assassinated and Lyndon Johnson's presidency and building on that movement to pass the Civil Rights Act and then Selma produced the Voting Rights Act. But let me say this, John. There was a downside in that decade, too. SNCC was no longer after a while led by John Lewis, but H. Rapp Brown and Stokely Carmichael. You had the riots in Watts in 1965, 67 Detroit and Newark. Dr. King was shot in 1968. 100 cities burned, including Washington, D.C. I was in Nixon's campaign, and by the fall of that campaign, John, the whole issue was even eclipsing Vietnam was law and order in America. And at one point, Nixon and Wallace together had almost 70% of the national vote. Hello. Well, that was quite a trip through history, thank you. Uh, but um, Nixon and Wallace together uh, culminate in the Southern strategy where mm -hmm. you take uh, political exploitation of the uh, plight, if you will, of blacks in the, in the South. And when Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill, he said, uh, we've lost Democrats have lost the South for generations, probably been more than that, more than one uh, generation. So I think when we look back, some of the egregious violations against African Americans in this country uh, have been resolved. But there are lots more, maybe more subtle uh, inequality that continues. And that initial march, I think it was for, for jobs and freedom, it was also for jobs and justice. And mm -hmm. jobs and justice are the two areas where the most disparity exists between whites and blacks. And when we recreate the march next week in Washington, you'll have three 
presidents there. They're all Democrats. Uh, I'm sorry President Bush or one of the President Bushes isn't going to be on that stage because this really shouldn't be a Democrat versus Republican uh, issue. It's an issue for all Americans. The question was, are we less conscious of race today than in 1963, more conscious of race, or are things about the same? So we're talking about race. We're not just well, talking about blacks and whites. Well, it, So if you're measuring by race as an indication, we're more race conscious today. In 1960, the Census Bureau measured four races, plus other. In 2010, it measured 14 categories, plus others. Well, I think so in, race many way, consciousness in many ways we're less, we're less uh, race conscious. We have to be because more people have diverse backgrounds. We've got more right. intermarriage. We've got more people of mixed heritage. I mean, I think that's commonplace. And I think most people celebrate that diversity. What do you think? Is it a result of diversity of population, race uh, consciousness? I think it's because we have learned to live together a lot better than we were, were doing at that point when that uh, march took place. I also happened to be there, well, you can, and it this, was an inspiring moment. Is this virtue moment. on our part? I don't know whether it's virtue. I think it is the fact that more and more Americans understand what America is about, which is a, a land of equal opportunity, and I think this is something that has really uh, improved dramatically since those days. And so I think it is a huge step forward, frankly. Uh, I feel that there is much more mobility in the society, upward mobility in the society, much more acceptance of people of different uh, ethnic backgrounds, different mm -hmm. racial backgrounds. I think it's all to the good. I'm not saying it's perfect. We still have a ways to go. But I think we've made great progress, and I think it's overdue. The census measures Irish American, Italian American, African American, et cetera, et cetera. Does that dilute the, uh, <laughs> over, the overconsciousness of black vis a white? It doesn't, it, no, it doesn't dilute it. If you, Talking to me, for example, as an African-American, what I will tell you is I don't, the sense of saying African-American African -American or Irish-American or Scottish-American, whatever, it doesn't matter. When I walk down the street and someone sees me, the first thing they're going to see is a black woman. If they mm -hmm. look at you or they look at you or they look at you, they're not going to say there is a Jewish-American, there is an Irish-American. You mm -hmm. see race and we identify with it. And quite frankly, um, the election of Barack Obama, I think, was one of the greatest political events I will ever see in my lifetime. But the country has become more race conscious mm -hmm. in terms of color and in terms of ethnicity since he was elected. The, the national debate on race in light of the jury verdict in the Trayvon Martin case absolutely demonstrated it. Our discussions about immigration reform and the place of Hispanics mm -hmm. in American culture absolutely demonstrate that when it comes to race, when it comes to ethnicity and people of color, we have a long way to go. Are black men lynched every day like they were in 1963, uh, in the 1960s and 1950s? No. Is Alabama now still bombing him? No. In that sense, things, things have changed and that change is wonderful and so many of us, myself included, still believe in America and America's mm -hmm. promise, but we've got a race problem. Are you a Jamaican American? I consider myself John, a Jamaican American. Uh, I consider myself a full-blooded American. I believe I'm an American Irish American. I believe in John, I have Scottish you're blood and in my veins. German. <laughs> John, you're confusing. This fellow is German. John, you're confusing. And he's he's a German, and, and Irish he's, American. You are and confusing he's... ethnicity and race. Oh, I am. Yeah, whether you're Irish or Polish, or I mean Danish, whatever Eleanor is, race is, is a category. I What's agree. ethnicity? Ethnicity is Irish or German or Italian. Race is black or She's white. She's a Jamaican American. What, is she a She's black American? Black. She's black, but it, or, or Asian or Hispanics, or basically uh, whites and blacks, that's what it is. And I'm, inc I'm inclined to agree, there is greater and greater awareness of the issue of race and greater and greater contentiousness, because quite frankly, whites are no longer 90% of the population, the dominant group, and so there's tremendous amounts of competition and conflict, and it's risen up increasingly since the Trayvon Martin thing, I agree with you. And unfortunately, I think, as, as we are all become minorities, I don't think it's going to get any better. But the contentiousness is, is really among a rather small group, I think, of white Americans who feel like their position in the society is being threatened. The younger people, younger That's white yeah. Americans, do not look at it that right. way. They, they look at this as a, a, a multicolored world that they've been the born into. Americans and they're okay young with, Americans. But older <laughs> Americans uh, <laughs> have a shorter trajectory here. I'm <laughs> sorry to tell you, Pat. <laughs> Which two groups does Gallup survey rank at the bottom in terms of relations? In terms of relations? Yeah. Relationships? I would say the, the, the blacks and Hispanics is one of those two groups. There, there's That's a correct. lot of, it is. It's both yeah. of them. Sixty-eight percent say the relationship is very or somewhat good. A full nineteen percent below how the same poll respondents rate the relationship between whites and Asians. 
Look, if you've got mm -hmm. a po if we've gotten to a point in time which we saw in the last election uh, and more recently with states like Texas and North Carolina doing everything that they can to suppress the vote of African Americans and Hispanics, we've got a race problem. And so mm -hmm. obviously, you know, it, if you look at that poll, it's telling us what we already know. There are people in power, particularly in the South in the red states that feel that people of color are taking something from them that they believe inherently belongs yeah. to them. People and now they've got to compete with us. People don't give up power easily. You exactly. think college admissions should be based on diversity? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think lots of factors go into diversity. I think race can be one of them, and I think the Supreme Court so far agrees 67, with that. You're, you're in the minority. Only 28% uh, no, in favor. It should be based on well, excellence, John. As long as the Supreme Court Who's, agrees with it's me, Just I'm like fine. the NFL, <laughs> whoever's the best player plays, and whoever does best academically should be advanced. But, what but is wrong I, with you? Here's think? a question I have. One of the things I always say, because I think you can measure diversity in a lot of ways, but I think there's an argument to be said that the greatest affirmative action program that there is in the country is being born white. There is a natural assumption when you're applying to, to, to institutions of higher education that you are excellent or you are more right. superb or more brilliant than others. Whites are the only but group you can you hear discriminate this? against legally in America. Pat, no. Why do you hear this piercing question? You ready? I'm ready. Exit question. Are attitudes lagging behind the social reality when it comes to the transformation of American society since Reverend King's speech? Things are far, far better in terms of everybody's economic uplift. All boats have risen. But I, I, what, so Michelle said, what Michelle said is correct. There's a real recognition and a growing intensity and contentiousness I think of feelings between the races in the last five years. And you're right to the extent, but those feelings of intensity are really a very small group of people right. who feel that mm -hmm. they somehow have lost, tell that, it, the advance it to of, no. that the advance of minorities in this country has somehow uh, caused them to lose something. More Most people do not feel that way. More progress has been made than people realize, yes or no? I'd go for yes, sure, why yes, not? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. The President of the United States of America is a black man, so the answer is absolutely yes. The answer is yes. Issue two, Obama's NSA overhaul. I wanted to ask you about your evolution on the surveillance issues. And even as recently as June, you said that these, the process was such that people should be comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And now you're saying you're making these reforms and people should be comfortable with those. So why should the public trust you on this issue? Mm -hmm. and? Why did you change your position multiple times? Well, uh, I think it's important to, to say, Carol, first of all, I, I haven't evolved in my assessment of the actual programs. In light of the changed environment where a whole set of questions have been raised, some in the most sensationalized manner possible, uh, where these leaks are released drip by drip, you know, one a week to kind of maximize uh, attention, and uh, see if uh, you know, they can catch us at some imprecision on something. In light of that, it makes sense for us to go ahead, lay out what exactly we're doing, have a discussion with um, Congress, have a discussion with uh, industry, which is also impacted by this, have a discussion with the civil libertarians, and see uh, can we do this better? That was President Obama facing skeptical questions about his four-point reforms he announced regarding the National Security Agency and its domestic surveillance programs. Edward Snowden, the NSA ex-insider, revealed much about how the NSA conducts its espionage. So, President Obama has offered these four reforms. One. The 2001 Patriot Act, oversee it, mainly Section 215 of the Act, which the NSA interprets as giving it its power to monitor Internet and phone records of Americans. Work with Congress for improved oversight of Section 215 and the Patriot Act, debating and discussing it. Two, FISA, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Revise the act to require that a civil liberties advocate participate in FISA court proceedings 
when a secret surveillance warrant is issued. Three, intelligence agency transparency. The NSA and agencies like it should be more candid with the public about ongoing domestic surveillance. Four, outside expert review. A panel of experts currently empowered to review the impact of technology on security, on privacy, and on foreign policy, then issue its interim report on this technology by October and a final report by December. Question, how would you describe President Obama's change of position since June when he said, quote unquote, the right balance was struck between privacy and security and his new reforms, balance them both out. Are the president's views regarding privacy evolving or is this a massive presidential about turn, a flip-flop. I ask you, Ellen. I don't think President Obama wanted to be the Democratic president that expanded the national security state. Uh, and the various disclosures that have come out since he made those initial statements in June saying he was okay with the balance have indicated that the um, you know, spying, if you will, on Americans is more widespread than we all initially thought. And so I think he's, he's open to reining this in. Uh, those are all reasonable steps you outlined. I imagine, you know, Congress is looking, looking it away, but I, I, you know, I still think he, he's not, not going to back away from basically continuing the programs that his predecessor put in place because of the times we live in and that national security brief he gets every morning. Is it possible that he didn't know the extent of the reach of the NSA and that you know, not to be uncharitable to him, he was not particularly interested in it mm -hmm. until it became uh, this full-fledged issue. Mm -hmm. I, I would venture to guess that he absolutely knew the full reach and extent of everything that was happening. You think so? I think so, and I think on a lot of foreign policy matters, which I do not disagree with, by the way, I don't think there's much difference between President Obama and George Bush. I think in this sense, what we've seen in terms of his reforms and his open, openness to transparency is probably something that is political. There's mm -hmm. a, a USA Today Pew poll that showed that people under age 29 are well, absolutely appalled by what happened. And let's figure, you right. know, we've got midterm elections coming up soon. We've got a presidential election in 2016. Okay. And Democrats need young people to vote for them. And youngsters do not like what happened. They think that it was appalling. Okay, the big flip-flop. Just to refresh our recollection, this is what President Obama said two months ago on June the 7th. This was prior to his NSA reform announcement. In the abstract, you can complain about Big Brother and how this is uh, uh, a potential, uh, you, know, you know, program run amok. But when you actually look at the details, then I think we've struck the right balance. Now, given what we know about surveillance and the NSA's behavior in it, do you think the right balance between privacy and security has been struck? Yes, I certainly do. I'm, I actually happen to be in favor of this kind of a program because I think of what would happen to this country if we had a half a dozen terrorist attacks every year. And uh, that seems to do me to be Obama the kind of... you think Obama knew all the details of what they do? Uh, by and large, yes. I think, well, sure. not, maybe not everything, okay, but I think he knew based on the reports that he must have been getting, just exactly uh, the uh, number of cases. So, this minute, there were he, They as estimated that something like 54 different terrorist attacks were in fact interdicted by the knowledge that they gained from this. He had to be Boy, informed on all of that. You don't think that Snowden was the catalyst? He was a catalyst. No, I think he absolutely right. was the catalyst. <laughs> absolutely. So, then, look, you hear what he, this, this man said, John. the president said, before Snowden appeared. John, yes. John, look. And he, I, I, if he knew all of the circumstances, would look, he have but, said what we just, but what we just think, played? As I say, there was a rationale for this. You're president of the United States. One of the things you're responsible for is the security of the country. Right. And if you find that 50-odd terrorist attacks were somehow or other stopped by this, it's a perfectly right. natural response on him to say, I think that program makes John, sense. Well, he's dismayed by some of the revelations that have flowed from the Snowden I, revelation. I am dismayed by some of them, but I still think Future this program Canadian? makes sense, and I think his reforms <laughs> John, uh, that he's look, talking you about make sense. Ways, about. Hey, John, look, what no. happened here is that I don't think Barack Obama was... I think he knew about the general program. He was disinterested he, in it. He is the bystander president. He was not deeply no, engaged no, in no. it. And what happened is, when all this stuff started breaking, the young people and other people, all of a sudden, it looked like almost a majority are saying, hey, the government's gone too far. 
And Barack Obama's politically inclined, so he's moving and moving and moving. He's been moving There's away from ring. it. He's going to keep the basic program as elementary. Maybe he didn't want to know about it. He, does, he doesn't care about Just a moment. Just a moment. He doesn't care about a lot of things oh. in depth. No, uh, he does. He didn't know about Benghazi. Wrong. He didn't know about the IRS. I think he, he didn't absolutely know about cares. Any of it. He is well, the president of the United States. The I think he has been. I think he has been strong, as strong as he can be. He has carried on a lot of the Bush administration policies on for, uh, in terms of foreign policy and young people. This is where we agree in terms of politics. Said this is not change. We so can believe moves. it. We don't like this. So he moved, but these four he, changes are moved, meaningless. What voting group? Is the most upset by this. He's moved Youngsters. Two Why? Wings. Youngsters because they they well, they don't the like the rules. They of use the technology, they do they not? Right. They and they're the afraid what? The extent to which the NSA can go trawling through well, what they put on their computers. Exactly. Yeah. Liberta and, they're libertarians. Yes, I think they're yeah. yeah. well, libertarians. And there's, and there's great, but they're young. And there's great misunderstanding. I mean, people think oh, that, yeah. that, that there's actually reading of their private emails. It's not happening. You know, nobody cares about their right. private right. email. That's not happening. Right. So well, we, uh, can feel, you know. we can feel good about this. And the yes. three guys, <laughs> the three mature men who left the, uh, the uh, security apparatus precisely for the same reason that Snowden did, they get no recognition at all. Well, they didn't rat everybody well, out. They, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, they they're all rat. Well, do you have to rat out yeah. in order? To get yeah. They shouldn't have. They behaved honorably, and but this kid did. And and all right, but we have confirmation of what Snowden said through the mouths of these three people yeah, who have since talked to USA Today. When, the you government. Look, when you look on, look into yeah, it, it's, this is, there's not this great crisis that some people are trying to make it into. There were 2,700 right. different kind of violations, of which well, only 900 out of well, 20, 240 million well, were the ones that should be done. A lot of young people are upset that Chelsea Manning has gotten the uh, number of years in jail that, that she's Apparently gating. Issue three, Egypt, no middle ground. My committee handles foreign aid. We will hold back uh, money unless there is a showing that they are taking steps, very positive, very direct steps to restore democracy. President Obama declared last week that while he's not ready to suspend the $1.5 billion in foreign aid to Egypt, he is prepared to do so if circumstances warrant it. Well, leading Senate Democrats may do it before he does. Senator Patrick Leahy chairs the committee through which U.S. funds for Egypt must flow. Unless Mr. Obama can convince the Senate otherwise, aid to Egypt will halt. That threatens a rupture in the U.S.-Egyptian strategic partnership that has been in effect since the historic 1979 Camp David Peace Accord. Before last week's crackdown, the Obama administration urged Egypt's military to allow the pro-Morsi street protests to continue. This alarmed regional allies like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Jordan. They sent emissaries to Washington to urge the White House to give its unequivocal backing to General Abdul Al-Zizi, Egypt's top military leader. Their reasoning is this. The struggle in Egypt is a Manichaean battle between Islamic radicalism and secularism. And only one side can win. Our regional allies believe President Obama has been searching for a non-existent middle ground between the Muslim Brotherhood and Egypt's secularists. After the crackdown, which left hundreds dead, thousands injured, and deposed President Mohamed Morsi now in detention, threats to cut off aid have come from the European Union and the United States. But Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, notably Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, have pledged an outlay of $12 billion, nearly 10 times America's military aid to Egypt to support the interim government. Question, is the U.S.-Egyptian relationship at an historic turning point? And if so, what should President Obama do, Mort Zuckerman? I think the president should not, not cut the uh, support for the military in uh, Egypt. They are our most important ally. 
ally and it's the most important country in the Middle East and we will lose the support of a lot of our other friends if we walk away from Egypt. They have done a tremendous amount of work with and for the United States. This is in a dram dramatically in our interest even though we disagree with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But compared the military to the, Mu the Muslim Brotherhood, we're coming out way ahead in terms of our interests and in terms of the quality of government they're bringing to the, uh, Egypt. There's another angle there. You remember what Eisenhower said? Beware the military-industrial complex. He's talking about the complex over here. We make all the munitions that that billion and a quarter is buying. That's correct? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this affects the American business directly, does it not? It can, yes. Does that give another turn to this wheel of decision-making that Obama is operating? You can look at it that way, but I will tell you that Egypt has been our most important ally and they are our most important friend to our other allies, like Saudi Arabia, like the Arab uh, Emirates, who are basically going to say, but if we can't rely on the United States, we can't rely on them at all. Our most important ally is Israel. Uh, not in the Arab world, let me tell you that. I mean, John, that isn't the issue. Oh, you're specifying this in the yes, Arab world. Yes, of course. John. That's uh, what the Middle East well, is. Well, what the about Arab the Saudis? World. The Saudis, the Saudis are in, 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 amazingly upset about the possibility that we might do this. They, the, and the, not only the Saudis, all of the Arab Emirates, all of the Arab countries who are I'm our allies. I'm talking about our alliance with I'm the Saudis. I'm talking about that. I can tell you that for sure. Well, and, and, and rightly John, so. They've got a relationship with the Egyptians. Look, forget the democracy. Excuse me. This is a showdown between the Muslim Brotherhood right. and the army. One or the other is going to prevail. They're both, if you will, dictatorial. You choose. We have to choose the military. They bottle up the, they bottle up the guys in Gaza. They work with us in the Sinai. They're their only protection, of, if any, of the Christians. You've got to pick these guys and stick with them. Now, Leahy says we cut off the aid. Sure, you cut it off, and pretty soon we're going to have to renew the aid. Pat, so yeah. why cut it off? Yeah. Predictions, Pat. In the wake of two black-on-white murders just this week, John, racial tensions deepen. Uh, Eleanor. Immigration reform bill gets a boost because Catholic priests are taking the issue into the pulpits. Mark. The weak economy in terms of employment and unemployment is going to continue to be the dominant issue for the rest of the year. Michelle. School choice is going to be the education issue of the 21st century, the most important issue. Russia's demographic demise will soon be seen as a total uh, falsification. 23 years ago, the birth rate was 1.2. Today, it is 1.7, midway between Western Europe's 1.5 and America's 1.9. No wonder Putin seems a little cocky. Russia has more babies than Western Europe. Bye-bye.